doctors, or your what-the-heck-happened-to-you moments. Followed this patient with my attending, 19 or 20-year-old African-American with sickle cell anemia, stroked out and was in a coma, intubated and put on a ventilator because they couldn't breathe on their own. The MRI was bad, still haven't seen another MRI like that one. With a the brain, there is essentially a three-day rule. If you have little change three days after a neurological injury, the chances of meaningful recovery are slim. Week one goes by, daily spontaneous breathing trials, test to see if they can breathe on their own. Fail. So the patient is kept tubed or vented. Second week goes by and we hit Thursday with no changes in status. My attending and I are reviewing after we see the patient, and we make the decision that the next morning we're going to encourage the family to withdraw care. Friday morning, we go in. Spontaneous breathing trial has failed, but the patient's eyes are open and following us around the room. Their eyes hadn't been open over those prior two weeks. My attending and I were absolutely shocked. We were convinced this kid was essentially brain dead, but now we've been proven wrong. Still, we didn't hold out much hope for more improvement. I mean, two weeks and they can open their eyes and follow people around the room? You can say we're pessimistic about the chance of recovery, but experience does speak for a lot in these situations. It's Saturday or Sunday. We can safely remove the breathing tube. Another week goes by, the patient is able to move their head around and start to move the arms or legs. Another week goes by, they're able to sit at the edge of the bed. During this time of rapid improvement, they still lacked fine motor skill and could not produce coherent speech. The patient would get frustrated, tearful, and despondent. In discussion with the family, I made the comment to my attending in private that the patient appears depressed. My attending brings up the likelihood of depression, and mom just snubs that. X has nothing to be depressed about. X is alive. We argue our case for depression with her. A month ago, X could walk, talk, and eat without assistance. X cannot do any of those things now. X's life won't ever be the same. X has every reason to be depressed. She was still in denial about the prospect of her child being depressed in that situation. The patient was discharged to rehab a few days after that conversation, and I don't know what happened to them after that. That case really is one of those cases that qualifies as a miracle to me. I don't believe in a higher power, but that was a very significant and completely unexpected recovery. Everybody involved in the care of that patient was sure that the patient was going to pass, and we were all proven wrong. It's a nice reminder that there are outliers. I feel especially bad for that kid, seeing as how the mom was acting. I would also be incredibly frustrated at that attitude right after waking up and coming to terms with my situation. But hey, maybe it ended up being a good influence on his attitude. Who knows? It just seems to me that it could much more easily have the opposite effect at that age. Story 2 I'm not a doctor, but I was diagnosed with Addison's at age 13 or so. It was just generally feeling lethargic, vomiting, dizzy... Mom calls the hospital with symptoms, and they said if I had all three at the same time to come in to be safe. Orderly or whatever checks my pulse in the lobby. 30 over 15. He laughs. Well, this one's broken. And gets another machine. 3 over 15. Wait, what? Calls a doctor, they double check it, and run me to the ER for fluids. Again, not a doctor here, but apparently that's not even high enough to have a pulse. They had no clue how I was walking, let alone conscious, but saw the numbers and after realizing it was accurate, they freaked the hell out. And of course, that freaked my mom out. Them telling my mom 3 over 15 is the BP of a deceased person did not help. And then they said it's either autoimmune or cancer. My immune system apparently ate my adrenal glands. Now I'm on meds for life. Lucky me. On the bright side, though, I never really have to worry about high blood pressure. Story 3. Not a doctor. A classmate of mine in high school was out snowmobiling in the middle of the night. He was going about 50 miles per hour down a trail. Some a-hole had put a chain across the trail just to be an a-hole. He didn't put reflectors on it, and it wasn't even on his own land. It was on state land. Unfortunately, my classmate hit a backrest on his sled. The chain hit him square across his chest. It slammed him into the backrest, which fortunately broke off. He rode back home and crawled into bed. Later, his mom made him go to the local clinic that had a small ER. They life lighted him down to Duluth immediately. He had a lot going on. He was bleeding pretty bad internally. The doc told him that if he hadn't been so muscular, he would have passed away on the trail. The man was about 6 feet and 245 pounds and ripped like a bodybuilder when he started. Six months and a bunch of surgeries later, he was maybe 130 pounds. He looked like death and his whole chest was railroad tracks. Now he's the same loud crazy person he always was. A successful business owner with a wife and kids. Everyone thought he was going to pass away, including the doctors, but he pulled through. I don't feel like a-hole is a strong enough word. Maybe something like criminally insane evil a-hole. Story 4. This guy... One of my prior patients is a roofer who lived a very full life of alcohol, women, and substances. He was infected with HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and was cirrhotic and didn't really care about his health at all. He was ghostly thin and weighed 110 pounds in a 6-foot frame, which included 20 pounds of ascites in his abdomen. He was angry and didn't listen to anyone, refusing therapy most of the time. 
I met him first in the ICU, where he had full-blown AIDS, end-stage liver disease, hepatorenal syndrome, unexplained lymph nodes all over his body, variceal hemorrhage, Kaposi's sarcoma, and spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Prognosis of in-hospital death was greater than 90%, even with therapy. I was involved in his care for about two weeks, and again, he refused every therapy that his primary physician suggested. I was surprised he lasted two weeks. Finally, he was so fed up with the noisiness in the ICU that he requested transfer to palliative care and was eventually sent to a hospice for patients with advanced HIV to live out his remaining few days. One year later, I got a call from the hospice requesting a follow-up appointment for him. I was shocked that he was still alive and asked if I could talk to him. It was all better. Turns out he had the hots for his nurse in the hospice and did everything she asked in order to please her, including taking his medications for the first time. She had slowly nursed him back to health, convinced him to restart HIV meds, put him on a slow salt diet for his liver disease, and then eventually got him up and mobile. He spent another six months in a rehabilitation facility, then went back to work. He saw me in follow-up for a while as we treated his hepatitis C, then his cirrhosis shockingly improved. After a couple of years, he moved away to another place to start a construction company and became rather successful financially, and remains abstinent in his former vices. He's the only person that I've seen come back from death. Story 5. Veterinarian here. An approximately six-week-old puppy was presented that had been left for dead. A good Samaritan found her and brought her into a clinic for euthanasia. It was a Saturday afternoon, who was about to close up shop for the weekend, and how this. She was a little fuzzy black ball, about a pound and a half, with soulful eyes. Had a lot of fractures. Had been this way long enough that the leg was hyperextended. He took the puppy in, looked at his nurses, and said, I'm not starting my goddamn weekend like this. I'll stitch up her belly and figure out what the hell to do with her on Monday. Monday rolls around and he brings her to the main clinic so that the vet student can practice fracture fixation before the pup is euthanized. Vet student, me, says in a tearful voice, if, if I fix her properly, do I still have to put her to sleep? Answer was, nah, but if you do that, you have to find her a home. Her name is Bits. Another vet student got the other hit by car stray dog to practice on. The nurses named her Pieces, plus one for dark humor by nurses. So I anesthetize her, prep the left leg planning for an IM pin, start making the initial skin incision and she doesn't bleed. Pretty sure that was a bad sign, so I chose to wake her up from anesthesia, give a blood transfusion and try again the next day. In the interim I do diagnostics and this little munchkin has, in addition to both back legs broken and belly wound, hook worms, round worms, whip worms, cochidia, demodectic and sarcoptic manges. I looked at her and asked her, how the hell are you still here? Seriously. She just looked at me and did little puppy grunts. Next day, her crit was holding steady, so I moved forward with a surgery plan. Single IM pin in the femur, and I had to manually flex the knee and return it to normal position. She recovers well, held her in my arms. I put her in the cage and set off down the hall to see some walk-in rooms in the meantime. Two hours later, I check up on her. Vital's great, in good spirits, but that damn leg is sitting backwards at the knee again. In puzzlement, I ask my mentor what I should do. He tells me to flex the knee manually again. I ask if that was safe to sedate her again so soon. He told me to do it without sedation. Q horrified, shocked look on my face. He sees my reaction, then tells me matter-of-factly that you're gonna have to do that every two hours for the next two days or that scar tissue will just come back. I go back to the pup, love on her, and apologize ahead of time for the pain I'm about to inflict. Even with meds on board, I knew this was gonna hurt like hell. She screamed in the most heartbreaking way. I was expecting her to bite me, but instead, she just licked my hand afterwards. I looked at her and said, You have got a home, little lady. You're coming with me tonight. Two days later and I've got the scar tissue thing under control, but flummoxed about how to keep the leg from flipping backwards. Both back legs broken, down to one working hip and one working knee on different sides. My mentor and I put our heads together and rigged up a contraption involving small IM pins placed traversely in proximal femur and distal tibia, bent into hooks on the end, connected by steel suture to limit extension and orthodontic rubber bands to encourage dynamic flexion. We didn't have an Elizabethan collar small enough for her, so I took x-ray film and cut one out and duct taped it together. She couldn't use either back leg. She was dragging herself along using front legs when I took her outside. Cutest little Franken puppy. Spunky as hell. Little yippy barks looking at the squirrels in my yard. A week later, and pelvic fractures sequelae rear ugly head. Her abdomen is bloated. I'm in my yard at midnight giving her mineral oil and emmas and promising God if he will help her poop, I will build her a doggy wheelchair. I don't care if she never walks again. Three weeks later, a furball tore up her e-collar, pulled the pins out of her using her teeth, and two days later is somehow running in the same yard attempting to catch squirrels. Three months later, she's catching them, and anything else she can find. She was my bestest friend for eight years. She went on to survive three water moccasin bites, an attack by a boxer, and liver and kidney failure. Probably damaged from the snakes, screw water moccasins. I euthanized her at eight years old. 
After her last stay in the hospital for kidneys, she came out and her old skeletal injuries were causing her pain. The day she laid on the porch and watched a squirrel in front of her without trying to chase him, she looked at me with such sadness. I knew this was that quality of life moment. I took her to Popeye's and got chicken, let her eat until she was blown up like a tick, then to the clinic. I held her in my arms and said, Goodbye, my baddie, snake-killing, squirrel-chasing miracle of a best friend. I love you forever. Damn it, I'm sobbing now. I miss her so much, guys. Damn onion ninjas, coming out of nowhere. You'll be cherished by the gods, you wonderful goddamn person. If this story made you cry all over the place, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel so you wouldn't miss out on any of my upcoming videos. Okay, time to wipe these tears. Now, <laughs> let's get back to the stories. Story 6. Had a patient who came to the CCU in cardiogenic shock, then developed pulseless VT. Proceed to intubate, code him for two hours, shock him greater than 13 times. Interventionist was on the way in, and finally are able to place an intraaortic balloon pump. It finally got sustained ROSC. We started dialysis and max pressors, and he was persistently hypotensive with MAPs in the 40s. He was unresponsive at this point. I went to the family to update them and the patient, explained that we got his heart beating again, but given the prolonged CPR and prolonged hypotension, there was a significant chance that his neurological status would be severely affected and would almost certainly never be the same again. I bring them into the room, and after a tearful reunion with their loved one, I head out of the room into a computer to start charting the train wreck that just happened. A few minutes later, the son comes out and tells me, I think my father is trying to tell me something. Now I hear this a lot from family members who are in severe grief after their loved ones suffer severe brain injury, so I'm skeptical, but come in to assess the patient. To my disbelief, the guy is wide awake and talking around his breathing tube, follows commands and writes out that he wants to be extubated in a piece of paper, 100% neurologically intact. We eventually extubate him after getting enough fluid off of dialysis, and he does well over the next few days, until he ends up developing severe septic shock and passing away later in the hospitalization, likely from ischemic gut and bacterial translocation, but for that brief period of time, I was flabbergasted. Story 7. Not a doctor. Very good friend is an anesthesiologist here in Mallorca, Spanish Island. A few years ago, this dude was brought by a Coast Guard helicopter to the hospital she works in. It's summer and they always get crazy busy because of all the tourists getting messed up and doing dumb crap. Mallorca has lots of beach resorts, big partying scene during the season. This guy's strapped to a board with neck braces, as is procedural under the circumstances, I'm guessing, because he's been fished out the sea after being spotted at 8 a.m. clinging to a rock in deep water by some chick in the paddle boat. He's conscious, clearly a bit drunk, but talking away pretty lucidly. They x-ray or MRI him, I'm no quack, to discover that he snapped the worst vertebrae you can snap. C6? This is an old story, and like I say, I'm no doctor. The one that normally paralyzes you from the neck down, basically. She's seen it a million times. People diving off boats without checking depth, trying to jump to the pool from balconies, tens of cases every summer. Very sad. Team goes into a frenzy, making sure that this guy can only blink and not move anything else. Yet no one can understand how the hell he was moving his legs and arms. Long story short, they secured the brake with two brackets so that it couldn't shift even a fraction of a millimeter, and that was pretty much that. Disbelief. The guy's up and back at work. He lives here. A week later. The story of how he got there was pretty funny, though. He was out shaking his t at this house party in the countryside and went for a drunken walk to smoke a cigarette and admire the stars. Maybe even shed a tear or two about how amazing life is. The type of crap I do when I'm on the Chardonnay. Problem is, he walks off a cliff in the process and falls 50 meters into the freaking sea below. Enough to end a good few of us right there. Doesn't pass away an impact. Doesn't get knocked unconscious and drown. Thinks, screw me, what happened there? and starts swimming. He said he could see the coastline with help from the moon, but it's a sheer rock face as far as he can see, but keeps following the coast regardless, and swims until freaking morning, pickled, with the worst broken spine you can have. At sunup, tired, damp, and no doubt slightly peckish, he finds a rock that he drags himself onto and passes out in the warm morning sun. He was pretty close to one of the public beaches by this point, hence the paddleboard lady. That's my doctor friend's, are you freaking having a laugh? Medical story. It's a belter. Story 8. Not a doctor. My wife was given a bad roll of the dice 21 years ago. She was 21. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia with Philadelphia positive chromosome, through forced remission, chemo, irradiation, and removal of her own bone marrow, cleaned and replaced, then 18 years of interferon treatment to keep it away and then onto Gleevec once it stopped working. Complications were many, but the worst was a nasty form of diabetes that killed off her kidneys in three weeks. The estimation was one to two years. Home peritoneal dialysis, she started to get better, but in November last year, after fighting for so long, she had a silent heart attack. 
When they got her into the coronary care unit, they found that her heart arresting was performing at 14%, and angiogram showed two of the primary arteries were blocked. Unfortunately, full diagnosis was impossible because CT scan and MRI could not be done. Due to renal failure, the contrast used could have ended her. We knew we were on borrowed time simply because in the CCU hub, there are four primary beds most people go into and then one stable are moved to the ward behind. Paola stayed in the primary bed for seven days. Double cardiac arrest ended it for her. First thing the main doctor said to us was, Do you want the whole truth, no sugarcoating? We said yes, and you could tell none of it was good, especially because every decision had to go past three departments. Renal, hematological, and coronary. This just makes you realize how important the time we have is. She was a fighter. What a wonderful woman. I'm sorry you lost her far too young. She was so lucky to have had this guy in her life. Story 9 About six weeks ago, my dad checked himself into the hospital with ice pick headaches in the top of his head. He didn't have a fever, so they didn't suspect meningitis, but they gave him some morphine to try and reduce the pain while they did tests. When he was in the middle of an MRI, he started having trouble breathing, and his heart began to fail. The doctors rushed him out, and he wound up hooked up to an ECMO machine and ventilator. After taking blood samples, the doctors found listeria in his bloodstream that have traveled to his heart and to his brain. After about a week and a half, he was able to leave ICU and enter an acute rehab facility. He was unable to walk and had severe delirium. He seemed to be progressing for a few days, at which point he seemed to decline and his delirium was getting worse. The doctors in the rehab facility were complacent, but after enough pushing, they did another CT scan after two and a half weeks, which revealed hydrocephalus as a result of the meningitis. He was rushed to another hospital, back into the ICU where drains were put into his brain to remove the fluid. However, one of the drains caused a brain bleed. Here we are about 11 days into this new ICU with a track and stomach peg as the blood and fluid are still being drained out. All the doctors can do is hope that he becomes responsive over the next couple of weeks. My family has really been through the ringer considering how healthy he was just six weeks ago at the age of 67. We are praying every day that he comes out of this. Story 10. Not a doctor, but a former cop. I was working in a gang unit at the time, and our unmarked car was chasing a vehicle that had refused to stop. The suspect ended up on a dead-end road. I was in the carrier, a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter minibus, aka bully bus, riot van, etc., in uniform with the rest of the team. The driver of a vehicle pulled it across the entrance to the road so the suspect, who had managed to turn his car around, had no escape from the dead-end road. I was in the jump seat, so first off the bus, and ran straight towards the driver's door, confident that seconds later I'd be smashing in the window and hauling out the driver, as he had nowhere else to go. Whilst I was approaching the car, I noticed a motorcycle courier parked at the side of the road. His bike was switched off, and he was removing his gloves, still sitting on the bike. I didn't think much of it. As I reached for the door handle, may as well check if the door is open before I start smashing windows, the suspect guns the vehicle and drives straight at the motorcycle courier. Rider and bike go down on their side onto the pavement, mounting the curb in the process. Because of his crash helmet, the courier gets strapped under the vehicle. Honestly, I will never forget the sight of this, and the car speeds off into the road at the junction. I'm first to the courier, having been running behind the car, and convinced that I'm going to find him dead. Miraculously, he was conscious. Even more miraculously, he escaped with nothing worse than a broken collarbone in the end. To this day, I'm convinced he came out so unscathed because he was wearing proper protective motorcycle gear. Yes, the driver was eventually caught hiding in a garden about 20 minutes later. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you made it this far, I'm sure you'll also enjoy. Doctors, what's your should-have-come-in-sooner story? Story 3 was wild. See you in that video.